So I have one of those indoor herb gardens. And one cold, wintry morning in New York, I was cleaning up my kitchen and looked over and noticed that it was just sitting there collecting dust. And so I decided to pay it some attention. I mean, growing some fresh herbs would bring some springtime to my apartment. So I cleaned it up, I added new fruit seed pods, I filled the water reservoir, and sat back to scroll through YouTube to reward my good work. As I'm scrolling through YouTube, what do I see? An ad for Click and Grow Gardens. Now, <laughs> raise your hand if you've had that moment when you've literally glanced around the room because you just know your phone's listening to you. It wasn't actually. I hadn't said a word. I had just run the faucet. This was purely a coincidence, fueled by the Bader-Meinhof phenomena, or what's more commonly known as frequency bias. Frequency bias occurs when, after you've seen, heard, or read about something, it keeps showing up. And that's the result of two other psychological phenomena. Selective attention bias, where we tend to just pay attention to that information that's right in front of us and most relevant to us in the moment, and ignore the rest. And confirmation bias, where we seek out things that tend to support our current thoughts of, and opinions and ignore anything that runs counter to them. After spending the morning planting my click and grow garden, I was just more likely to notice the ad. The reality is I had sown the seeds to be targeted with that message long before. <laughs> and I did need new seed pods. I'm an author and tenured professor of advertising at Syracuse University. I spent a 25-year career helping advertisers place their campaigns in the most efficient and effective manner. I have studied the best ways to get the right message in front of the right person at the right time. Now, I'm sure you're savvy to the fact that that 10% discount you get when you sign up for that company's newsletter, well, that gives them access to your name and your email address. And then that can then get connected to your physical or shipping address, your IP address, your phone number, which documents where you are. I mean, I need ways to know where I am if I want it to take me someplace else. And there's information that's part of the public record that gets connected as well. Things like where you work, what kind of car you drive, your credit score. There's information leaking out everywhere and we're told that our data is our own and should remain private. But we're not told why or what the internet might look like without it. We need to stop thinking that any data sharing online is evil and see that the intentional sharing of data is crucial to the democratization of the internet. When the World Wide Web was created in 1989, the vision was to create a place where all people had access to the best information at any time. And that utopian vision has largely been realized, but to stay true to that vision, we must become good citizens of the internet. <laughs> now, I want you to imagine a day when you're actually annoyed that your phone doesn't know who you are. Well, we kind of have a sneak peek. In 2020, Apple's Safari browser became one of the first and the largest to block tracking so as to protect your privacy. If you're an avid Safari user, by now you've encountered some instances where some sites just don't work as well. So what's happening here? Why was Safari tracking us in the first place? Well, as the web grew, a problem arose. That problem was every time you returned to a site, it was like 50 first dates. You were a new person every time. Now, I want you to think of a place that you uh, visit frequently. Maybe it's a restaurant, a coffee shop, a bar like Cheers. The reason you keep going back is because everybody knows your name. Let me share an example I think you can relate to. I stop off at the same coffee shop every morning on my way to campus. If I had to order my double shot skim latte to the same barista every morning, that would be weird and annoying. They know me. They know what I drink. So the early web browsers needed to solve that problem. And an engineer by the name of Lou Montulli decided to tackle it. Lou's solution was to create a small piece of code that could get placed on your browser so that when you returned, they could remember you, they could welcome you back. That code is what's known as cookies. Cookies were created simply as a way for a website to have a relationship with you. 
Imagine if you had to enter your address and your credit card every time you wanted to buy something from Amazon. So where does advertising come in? Well, throughout the 1990s, money was pretty much freely flowing to anyone with an idea for a website. The number of websites grew from just 2,700 in 1994, which was the year the first internet ad ran, to over 17 million in 2000, the year the dot-com bubble began to burst. As businesses began to fail, it became evident that not every online idea was going to turn to gold. So we realized that we needed to start measuring and quantifying these online investments. But how are we going to do that? Well, conveniently, we had a way to know if you had seen our ad and whether or not you had acted on that ad. The cookie. Before the internet, the way to reach people was through mass media, like television, radio, newspaper. These media served up the content that you wanted to see for free or very low cost, and you enjoyed that content in exchange for seeing some ads around the, along the way. This unspoken value exchange is what supported mass media for decades. But it was just that, mass media. The only information we had to determine who we were reaching with our campaigns was based on age and gender. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never met anyone at a party and said, hi, I'm a woman between the ages of 25 and 54. In that moment, I've offered you no valuable information with which we can build a relationship. For much of our history, you saw an ad simply because of your age and gender. The cookie now provides a way to go beyond just demographics and gives us an understanding of what you might be interested in, what you might like, what messages might actually be relevant to you. This was the birth of online behavioral advertising. Now, rather than seeking to reach mass audiences, we're talking to smaller audiences based on what they're interested in, what they're shopping for. You no longer see an ad because you're a woman between the ages of 25 and 54. You see an ad because you've been searching for beach vacations, and a hotel has a deal they want to offer you. When that hotel ad appears on the site, the site earns money to pay for that content, and you get a deal on your hotel stay. Without that value exchange, you have to be willing to pay to access that site. So next time you see Accept All Cookies, think about the value that you put on the content that site is providing. And if what you're watching or um, viewing is remembered, what's the potential harm to you? Or might it actually improve your experience? Much of the argument for opting out of data is that with just a handful of data points, you can be identified as an individual. In fact, John Oliver did just that in a Last Week Tonight episode. The show bought a handful of data sets, and within just two hours, they were able to identify someone's name, address, and phone number. But think about it. It took two hours of time and the purchasing of data to identify one individual, something you could have simply have done by using publicly available records if you were so inclined. So while it's true that it's possible, it's not practical nor useful for marketers to do so. Since the turn of the century, the amount of information accessible to marketers has grown exponentially. Marketers have had to become smarter about what data they collect and how they use it. In our capitalist society, companies make products that they hope people want to buy, and they promote them to the most likely customers. If I've done my job right, I advertise Click and Grow Gardens to people who live in apartments in urban areas who might want to grow fresh herbs in the winter. So in 2021, Apple once again doubled down on privacy and implemented what's known as App Tracking Transparency, or ATT. If you're an iPhone user, you started to see this message, ask app not to track. According to Statista, up to 75% of iPhone users did just that. But the Gartner Group, a leading industry researcher, has predicted that that number will decrease to 60% once people live in a world of untargeted ads. So next time app ask, ask App Not to Track pops up, uh, why not consider allowing? Remember my Waze example in the beginning? I want Waze to know where I am. I need Waze to know where I am. 
And if they happen to know that I also have a Starbucks app on my phone and want to offer me a discount to the Starbucks coming up two miles down the road, isn't that a win-win? The impact of ATT is already being felt. Meta has announced their Meta Verified service. For $15 a month, you can get your account verified, gain access to customer support, and boost the visibility of your posts in their algorithm. Now, you might be thinking, I don't need a ver verified account. I'm happy with my free version of Instagram. I agree. But what that means is you're going to start seeing posts from the creators who are willing to pay and fewer posts from the people that you actually want to see. This is the direct result of users turning off tracking and the resulting loss of ad revenue. So why is this crucial for democratizing the internet? While it's been said that for the big tech companies, you are the product, the reality is what fuels a free and open internet, what gives you access to information that you use every day to make decisions in all aspects of your life, is advertising. The only way for a content creator to make money online is to sell subscriptions or sell advertising. And by some estimates, content creators are going to lose up to $18 billion due to this loss of data. So think about the last time that you visited a website and had to pay to access that content. How did that make you feel? Did you happily reach for your credit card? Or even worse, were you stopped short in your tracks because you simply couldn't afford it? If we accept the premise that companies are using our data for purely profit motives, then we have to be willing to live in a world where only those who can afford it have a right to that content. Case in point, the New York Times has built one of the most successful subscription models online today. In 2022, their print revenue, their digital revenue surpassed their print revenue for the first time. Almost 90% of their subscribers have digital-only subscriptions. Yet, when COVID hit, they put their COVID coverage outside of the paywall. Why? Because it was considered critical information necessary for the public good. The social psychologist and author Shoshana Zuboff has termed this surveillance capitalism. She describes it as a profit making incentive to use personal data to target consumers more precisely. Well, it is true that companies seek to make a profit, and they do so by promoting their products to the li most likely customers. But you have to know that the data that is being collected, stored, and analyzed is not personally identifiable information. These data are anonymized, and algorithms are used to find these tribes, these groups of people who might be interested in the same things. Now, in my classes, I have my students log into their Google accounts. Google will tell you what interest segments they've placed you in. For many of my students, Google thinks that they're a male 45 plus, because in many cases, they're using their parents' accounts. Where is the precision in that? If you believe that the cornerstone of a functioning democracy is free and open access to information, then consider what you're giving up when opting out of sharing your data. According to Pew Research, the majority of people around the world believe that income inequality is a major problem. As we seek to solve that problem, we need to be mindful of not creating attention inequality. Attention inequity will be the direct result of internet business models moving to subscription-only models. So, here are a few things you can do to be a good citizen of the internet. Next time you're confronted with accept all cookies, be mindful of that value exchange proposition and maybe say yes. When ask app not to track pops up, ask yourself if sharing might enhance your experience and go ahead and allow. Manage your location tracking and only turn it off when it's not necessary for anyone to know where you are. Check your privacy settings in Facebook and Google. See what interest groups they've put you in. Tell them when they've got it wrong. Be in control of your information. The internet is an integral part of our lives. The genie is out of the bottle. 
If you believe in a democracy, then you must believe in a democratized internet where all people have access to the best information at any time. We must give in order to receive. So let's all be good citizens of the internet. Thank you.